All right, so now we are on to the Dragonflight Alpha group interview with Ian Hazacostas. Release date, power infusion. Wait, he talks about power infusion? Interesting. I actually don't... I mean... I think someone asked that in an interview and I just like kind of zoned out as to exactly what, cause I've, I've heard their rhetoric on this for a while. Like you don't need to really hear what they say about power infusion because when they have power infusion in the, in the game, put it back into Dragonflight and then also add Restless Crew, you can tell that they think that that stuff is good, right? So like you don't need, they're just gonna say that in an interview question cause you can tell by their actions. Anyways, uh, so we've seen the with the Drakthir and other talent trees at, a resurgence of party and raid synergy skills. For example, Mark of the Wild returning and the Drakthir bronze buff. And even Rogue has the party-wide cooldown reduction buff. Also, Drak, uh, Drakthir, not Drakthir specifically, but Drakthir and Evoker, I mean, I guess they're one and the same. They also have a strong party-wide buff as well. What is the goal for party and raid synergy in Dragonflight? So I think this is definitely a space we're interested in exploring. And not everything that is in these first iterations of talent trees is necessarily going to make it to live. But we want to get the stuff out there to begin that conversation and feedback around what the individual trees end up being. I think for the space of party and raid buffs, at the end of the day, it's an MMO. We have tons of cooperative gameplay in all of our modes, whether it's a dungeon, raid group, raid, group PvP, and the ability to make the choices that are augmenting the capabilities of people around you is an interesting RPG space to explore. At the same time, we also want to be mindful that we want to dip our toes in the water without going too far to the extreme of 15 years ago in Burning Crusade. Making a raid group as a raid leader was a matrix of 15 different buffs. Your rogues needed battle shot from a warrior, but the warrior needs wind fury from the shaman and all of that interconnection. We know we can go too far, but I think we want to test out individual ideas, see which are the most compelling, and also take a look at the sum total of it and make sure it's not too much in terms of the complexity space that's going to lead to micromanagement. But the general design space of I can make choices that make my buddy stronger in a cooperative game feels like a natural one we want to explore. Definitely. Oh, and then he answers this right after that. I, I Also, if you guys want to check it out uh, just randomly about this, I don't know how much he's going to go into this. Uh, Jeff Hamilton, actually, former Blizzard dev, currently working on the Riot MMO, um, had an excellent, very insightful tweet about Power Infusion and how it affects a gaming community like WoW and the different parts of it. Very good tweet. Um, I retweeted it as well. Uh, if you go back on my Twitter, you can find it. I don't know if you know his. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, this is definitely a lot. Also, I don't know if they're going to ask it later. I really It looks like they're not because there was no follow-up to this and they didn't ask it here. But like, I think... I like the idea of adding more raid buffs into the game because the thing that didn't make sense to me in Shadowlands was that like half the classes in the game almost, actually more than half, had raid buffs that were, had to be brought. They were very strong. 5% increased magic damage, 5% extra health, uh, obviously 5% physical, uh, a 3% raid-wide damage reduction all the time. Insane, right? Uh, then there was like smaller ones like, uh, you know, like, you know, the boss having less melee speed with rogues and warlocks and all that stuff. But like, you, they took away the ability to have scrolls like you had BFA. And BFA, if you had to drop one of those classes from a fight in like a world first level, you could because the scroll was that good. Now keep in mind, I'm not going to be making my argument in here about world first stuff at all. Like, yes, I would technically like to have 20 slots to just with my, my paintbrush to just paint it however I want. I want exactly this and this is what I can get instead of basically having only seven or eight slots this expansion to really work with. Um, but I'm not talking about me. I don't, I think this actually has such a massive effect on the majority of people who raid. And I think the people, most of the people who raid like clear heroic in pugs or in AOTC, um, or like AOTC guild groups. Those, I think that's the majority of people who consume raid content and, or, uh, even if they end up doing mythic, they at least go through that and they don't have exactly 20 people and they have to like pug some people to recruit for mythic early mythic stuff. Those groups, and I've played with them a lot on stream and off stream, actually, for fun. Uh, and they are frequently missing one or two of these buffs that are extremely powerful. And it absolutely affects them in a negative way. And it would not, it doesn't actually promote any like positive gameplay for them. Because what happens is they know they don't have that buff and they feel bad because they want to play with their friends and their friends want to play the classes they have fun to play. They have fun playing. Uh, and they 
are either forced to like re-roll a demon hunter for a buff that is insane or and they maybe not don't like that class so they don't get to play their main and they have to play a class they potentially don't like or they feel bad because their raid is just not as strong a lot of people go through this problem it's actually a community problem it is not a world first problem at all this is a community problem where that happens now when you have way more party buffs where if you and and raid buffs where when you're just recruiting a bunch of people into a pug raid you're just bringing in a bunch of different things instead of specific power increases but like everyone kind of has one like the idea of how to fix this being every class has like some kind of raid buff then that that's like the direction they're going kind of even though some classes don't have them and i, I have a few suggestions to like kind of fix that um but like that that is that's like the the answer i think for where they want to go like the the alternative to this by the way is like no raid buffs but i don't think that really solves anything because if they took away like all raid buffs it would just become oh well we're just only going to bring classes that have like roars and rallies and you know just like evoker damage reductions and and then if you took away all of that shit this is not how wow would ever be that would like homogenize wow and it would make it a much worse game then you would just bring the classes that only did the most damage and that's kind of weird you know you'd, you'd start seeing raids invite similar to how high level mythic plus keys invite where they only invite the very best classes that does not happen in raids to a much lesser extent but i mean like really no like if you have the right eye level you're like you'll get invited to a pug right uh so that's like kind of the way they're going with it i would definitely suggest for the few classes right now who don't have anything i feel like the game would actually be in a pretty good spot if hunters went back to what they could do a few expansions ago where uh they pick like three or four of the raid buffs right now and they just can have a pet that brings those i think that would be a great spot for them and then just give sh elemental shamans and resto shamans some kind of party utility similar to what you've done with rogues uh and with evokers and stuff like that i, I think because enhancement already has it it would already fit and then like honestly there wouldn't be a lot of things in this game that don't like bring something important uh and uh that would be good hunters are absolutely in need of a this is true hunters and arguably shamans uh the two uh caster shamans are in need of a button and i don't know what that button is and it may be two buttons but most likely one they need a button that does some good ass shit to kind of put them in line with everything else they're they like going into next expansion right now the two classes that are at the highest chance of like missing raid content are absolutely hunter and shaman in my opinion from like a dps standpoint because a lot of everything else in the game kind of just does stuff and they don't like they're very dependent on their tuning and that's been very up in the air in the past so um we'll we'll read the we'll read you think you need to read the shaman data mining oh yeah so quick disclosure i haven't read the shot shaman data mining i'm doing that uh later today most likely so it's possible they did give them some stuff and that would be really good amen and then if that's the case then uh i what one thing i know for sure is that hunters don't have anything give them a thing and this game will have very little issues in that way um okay random rant from one paragraph i promise you this thing isn't going to be like 10 hours long i'm not going to go that long on every question um okay uh let's see oh dk's yeah so dk's a really weird argument and I can understand why DKs are unhappy with this, but the thing is, is having the ability to have a bomb slim or grip in general is so unbelievably good for multiple raid fights every tier that it is probably more, more important than any singular raid buff in the entire game and probably multiple combined on those fights. And no other class can even really compete with it. So that kind of is their raid utility and they also have a raid defensive cooldown which in my opinion by the way just to make this open and if blizzard watches this like i think amz should absolutely be buffed i think it should be like i think the damage cap thing is fine whatever i think that's better than changing the cooldown or changing the ability uh but it should just be more than it is now like 100 that would make that make a lot more sense like dps amz's actually disappear after any relevant damage event in, in mythic right now when the whole rate is stacked it's pretty bad uh but yeah anyways moving on in terms of community feedback uh one of the hot topics has been the return of, a, of the controversial ability power infusion on the priest talent tree are there any changes being planned to address some of the issues the community has had with the ability such as how it impacts class balance they have changed a few things with pi right they 
made it so you basically get the PI legendary for free, except it's not even the PI legendary. Doesn't it also give you 100% of a PI? So if you PI someone else, you get the full usage of that PI. Now, obviously you could argue like timing being an issue. Uh, and like specifically, I don't even think healer priests will take that talent on the tree because almost always when DPS want PI, that PI is a terrible timing for a healer. Healers work on completely different timings than the rest of the raid. Um, the PI legendary did exactly that. Okay, yeah, yeah, but okay, yeah. So they give you the twins legendary. Uh, for some reason, I thought the I ha we haven't used the twins legendary since uh, Castle Nathry, but for some reason in my head it was the same as the innervate thing for Resto Druid, where they get fifty percent of one when they give it to someone else, but it's actually all of it. Yeah. Um, so I think it'll have less of an issue with that. I think like the major thing people hate about PI is two things. So. Number one, it's, and I think this is actually definitely an issue in other guilds. Like we don't ever experience this. No one in our guild could ever begin to care about parsing. Um, but I understand that like we're, you know, we're kind of our own thing. Uh, we're like a lot of people parsing, it kind of bugs them. The thing is, is like on logs, you can kind of see like who's using, like who's getting external buffs very easily. So it's like pretty easy to see that like, you know, you could be like the top person who didn't get PI for your class, right? I mean, like that's just as impressive as having the top log kind of thing. Uh, but also people just want to do big damage. I actually think the bigger problem is this. 25% haste is a massive number and it majorly changes haste scaling classes, how they play when they get it. And it's, it's objectively more fun to play a class Mo a few classes with PI than without PI and it majorly affects your ability it gives you more cooldown reduction in some cases it just you know makes you fast as fuck and like can keep certain cooldowns up longer uh to where it being in the game I feel like it, the the thing that's the most problematic is the fact that like you get a you get a like a hit of what that feels like and then when you don't have it you just feel worse like it just feels it feels bad to not have it once you know that it's there you're not actively thinking like man this other guy in the raid's having more fun than me right because like if you're like a dk dps and then the other dk dps in your guild's getting pi'd it's like yeah i mean he's gonna beat you right but like you know obviously like you know that you don't have pi and everyone in your raid knows that too right um i, I really think it's a gameplay thing like i think it's like Knowing that the game could be more fun if you get picked is just like a weird dynamic. Uh, okay. So I said I wasn't going to talk for a long time, and then I did. But I mean, that's like what this is, right? So, <clears throat> amen. It'll sl I'll talk less later, you know? Uh, these are just two massive things, so. I understand it's controversial, but at the same time, uh, some of this gets back to the earlier discussion of party and raid buffs and our philosophy there with adding new ones. It is a, it is a cooperative MMO, where in the design space of I can make my comrades, comma, my allies stronger, very epic phrase there, it seems like viable support type role that should exist in an, R in an RPG setting. Uh, definitely, uh, I'm not going to like cut in here actually. I was just basically going to say that like healers usually don't mind giving away stuff because healers in WoW are like supports. And WoW was a thing before MOBAs were like super, super, super popular in like the meta in gaming. Uh, so, like, people understand that more now than when WoW, like, first came out. Like, supporting other people, having buttons that exclusively help your teammates is totally fine as a healer because they're already bought into that philosophy. Internally, it's interesting. The team is the, the team has coined this problem. There are two games being played in a raid group. Yep, this is the thing I was talking about. Every, every single conversation I have had with a Blizzard dev has mentioned game one and game two. There's game one, which is the game that we built, which is beat the raid boss, clear the dungeon, and the time limit. Then there's game two which players have largely created for themselves, which is a win DPS meters, beat my performance from last week, get a purple parse, get a gold parse, whatever else. We don't create that game, but many people are playing it, and it is almost the primary motivation for them. A question is, how sensitive should we be to that? How much should we be designing on that? Um, because yes, certainly if we were making a game and the point of the game was to maximize your score, maximize this number, it would be problematic to introduce elements into the game that are very random or skew outcomes one way or another. This is a really fucking good answer, by the way. Uh, I feel like a lot of people haven't looked at it this way that currently are upset about things about, like, PI. But it also makes sense that they're upset because there are a lot of people, a lot of people watch my stream for sure, that only play this game for this reason, right? Like, this is actually, funny enough, the highest level of rating, like, world first rating, is actually this. There's actually... Basically none of this in in our guild. 
and hasn't been for years. This is actually something that exists only in like the like upper to high to mid level to like, I mean, like probably 90% of guilds, but it's just not actually at the top. Like no one actually cares at the top, but it's like, it's like in between there, people care. And then at the bottom, they don't care. Uh, but it makes sense though, too. Like I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't, I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong to do that or like, you know, we're like above that or anything. Almost everyone in our guild currently probably got this good by being a parse lord and caring about that shit, right? You became so good at doing damage because it was all you cared about that you were actually able to do it without thinking about it and actually focus on everything else, you know, getting better, right? I was a fucking absolute demon <laughs> about that, right? But like, uh, you know, with just when you get to this level, it's just something you don't really care about. Um, but like, if, if you are raiding and you're not raiding to like get a world ranking and you're just raiding to have fun, it is very normal to want to it, forget about everyone else. I mean, it's kind of fun to cram on your guild every now and then, but you just want to like keep getting better and like seeing how much damage you're doing is a good way to see how well you are playing and how well you're getting over time. That's like most of it, right? Um, uh, yeah, somewhere in the middle of all that. Okay. Uh, that's not a game we've made. We created a cooperative game that pre presents these challenges to be overcome. And so something in that environment like power infusion is a really interesting decision in a range of raid settings. Maybe on farm, you sell it to the person with the best burst window. But when you're learning an encounter for the first time, it's more, what are the moments in the fight that are the most challenging for us? Do we need to burst down this wave of ads before this next thing happens? And who, who should we PI? Should we PI a healer because we need to throughput burst to make it through this thing? DPS isn't an issue, we're just trying to survive, but we don't want to add a healer. It's these sorts of decisions that are an interesting group dynamics that we would hate to take away. The thing is, though, is this almost never happens to the majority of people who raid. This is something, this is almost exclusively how we use PI, and probably not a surprise to you as why we, I really like PI. There's probably some people in our guild who don't like it for the exact reasons I mentioned earlier. But like, I like PI because I like figuring out where it's good. But the thing is, is it hasn't actually given you that choice in a long time. So Castle Nathory was actually when it was best, and I'll give an example for that. But you've basically PI'd one or two classes just by default because they were the best for like a year now, a year and like three or four months. So you haven't even really thought about it. But in Castle Nathory, you actually made these decisions and it was interesting and uh, like fun to figure out. Like on Sludgefist, right? On Sludgefist, you PI'd and the, the correct PIs for doing that boss on progression were PIing Unholy DKs on the pole with army, because uh, they had their army back up for the fourth pillar, PIing hunters at the time before nerfs uh, on the second pillar and during their wild spirits when their two minutes came back up. Uh, and then on the fourth pillar, fourth pillar, you PI'd Demo Locks, who their three minutes, or uh, Affliction Locks, who their CDs came up after using on the first pillar and now are up on the fourth, and they just did the most in lust with PI. So you actually, one singular priest would actually PI uh, three different people on a like six or seven minute encounter right and that was all figured out in real time by like you know just doing it like that that like what i just described is actually cool as fuck uh but you know most people don't have to make decisions like that like sometimes in this expansion you like pi to paladin with ashen and like uh sometimes you pi'd like your tank you like pi'd blood decay a little bit in sepulcher prog uh to like like for the dancing room up and shit when it first came out like there, there's all kinds of like uh, like stuff that like people tried, but like a lot of people don't actually interact with it. That's very much like a top guild thing and like a top player thing in any content. And most people, it's just like you PI a class and that's kind of boring. Uh, so this is like, this is interesting. He is right. He's exactly right. Like this does exist. I just think he might be wrong on how many people this actually affects. Uh, and game two, so to speak, is also the one in where the rules in other places are shaped by the community. Like everyone at this point thinks nothing of the fact that log sites completely ignore padding. You can maximize your number just by damaging a bunch of extraneous ads and he's kind of spitting chat in a fight that don't really serve the interest of the group. And doing that will make you have the biggest number in win meters and the community has collectively decided this is unhealthy. We're not going to count or reward that behavior just because you're multi-dotting all these ads that will die on their own. We're not going to count this damage at all. Warcraft logs is what, what he's talking about. That's not entirely true because they don't do that on every fight. It's really weird. Like, because there are fights where it's very obvious that they are padding. Uh... Right? And then there are fights where people are padding because the ads technically need to die. Right? Um, but... 
they don't actually like clearly at a certain point after you kill a boss for a first time it just becomes like a race to see who can kill them faster and get all their damage in and like so clearly people are padding on them but they are important ads but that only happens like after you've done the boss for a bit um and you're better at it to where those ads aren't as much of an issue yeah yeah council blood moonkins might be the most extreme example of classes padding and not doing fights correctly is most moonkin players on council blood that is for sure. But it would never count that damage as padding on on Warcraft logs because those adds need to die. It's just that almost all of their starfall damage they were doing to them with the comp or with the strat that everyone ran was completely and totally irrelevant. Unless you had like six or seven moonkins. I think it was seven moonkins. Starfall actually Starfall actually killed the adds before they got under the boss. What I'm referring to, if you guys are confused, uh, like if you don't actually know the fight I'm talking about, basically if these adds spawn around the room. And Moonkins would Starfall, and it would be their main damage, and they'd be, like, cramming DPS meters. But it would only get these adds, the little dancers, or the waiters, to, uh, like, around, like, 30 or 40%, depending on how many Moonkins you had. But then they got grouped on the boss, with or without DKs. Um, and then they just died when they were under the boss. So the difference between a full health waiter being under the boss and a waiter that had been Starfalled for 30 seconds being at 40%, the one at 100% dies in 4 seconds, the one at 40% dies in 2 seconds. Who cares? There's, it's still going to die instantly. And all that damage you did basically was worthless. Um, but And then on top of all of that, not only that, but most Moonkins were pressing Starfall so much just to pad on that fight that they didn't have a full uh, Astral Power meter to throw Star Surges into the dutiful attendants that spawned, even though they're one of the absolute very best classes to ever kill those adds. So they were not only padding, but they were also griefing. Uh, so yeah, that was like, that was a, that was a like legendary historical padding situation. And it was by almost everyone in the community that was playing Moonkin on that fight. Um, uh, what is it? Let's see. Uh, moving on. Uh, he's totally right, and he was talking about Wowhead, and that's down here. Okay, and that shapes player behavior there. To some extent, we want to focus on designing for the so-called Game 1, and making that the best experience possible, and leave it to the community and log sites and others to figure out the rules for how they want to determine who the best hunter is or who the best mage is on this fight. He absolutely spat. This this entire this is this is maybe I'm, I can't believe people told me not to read this interview because it wasn't that good. This is like the singular best response to PI that has ever existed. And if you read this, even if you're still like I don't like PI, even if that's you, you're just like I get it, Ian. I hear what you're saying, but I play the game I want to play. Fuck that shit, get out of the game. Even if that's still you, if you read this and actually think that he's lost. Or something like that you are the one that's lost he totally fucking gets it he's basically saying i totally get what you guys are saying but we don't even make that get like he's he's fucking spitting dude and he's tired of your all shit too you all hear you could hear it in the way he was talking mm. uh yeah he's right all right dragonflight testing time frame you are targeting the Dragonflight release date for end of 2022. How comfortable are you for hitting that target window? Oh uh, yeah, they changed the way they tested stuff a lot. That's what he's going to talk. We're going to skip this whole paragraph. Uh, they they have changed the way that they've done a lot of their testing to like save a lot of time. Uh, and I don't like the alpha at the moment right now is basically the same as like Shadowlands being released. Like Shadowlands alpha. This is like you had the zone. You had like a certain amount of classes with Torghast. Like, if you think about what they need to do in this expansion compared to what they needed to do in Shadowlands, it's actually a metric fuck ton less. It's like talent trees. <laughs> it's like talent trees versus like Torghast, Covenants, Soulbinds, Conduits, all the shit that they had, like, like actually just probably three to four times more stuff for the game to work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I have no issue with where Dragonflight Alpha is right now. Time, it Only time will tell. But like Blizzard is ha, is and has been very confident that the expansion is coming out this year. I don't think that's fake. And uh, well, we'll see too with raid testing. Because that's, uh, I mean, if everything is the same, it's probably going to be in like two or three months or something. Yeah, so. Uh, let's see. Uh, just going to totally skip that. 
basically Shadowlands. Actually, wait, this act this part actually looks interesting. Dragonflight has been in development since before Shadowlands ships in the full development cycle of any, and has had the full development cycle that any WoW expansion has had in the past. The difference this time around is that we have consciously decided to have more focused public test period. Whereas in the past, I think we'd start our alpha with the game in less of a state of readiness and then slowly trickle content online over the course of a couple months. Very true. I forgot the exact date, but for Shadowlands was like mid-April when alpha started and it wasn't until sometime in the middle of June where even the last leveling zone was available. BFA was again a three-month gap between alpha launching and Stormsong being available for testing. Okay, same thing. So they're basically, they basically just uh, shortened the public part of it. Uh, this time around, all of our zones are ready for testing. And we're going to be rolling them out over the course of successful successive alpha builds in the coming weeks. This is actually kind of lit for content. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip the rest of this, um, but uh, this is really exciting for content because it actually means like every Tuesday there's gonna be a build with a with like new stuff in it basically instead of it like in the past sometimes it would be like two or three weeks from what he's saying here where like really anything would change on there and it, it was kind of boring. Uh, this is kind of a change of pace from how you developed the game in the past. Uh, what was the thought process of making that change? Why did you feel like you needed to change the way you went about alpha and beta? Uh, we want to focus on feedback. Got it. Okay. Will you be... Oh, he actually mentioned that content creators are struggling finding new things to do. That's actually interesting that that is a... I mean, dude, it feels great as a content creator, but I, I don't know how much that matters for actually making the game. Um, will you be announcing different areas progressively throughout alpha? Will there be a release schedule... Uh, okay. Yep. Skipping. Evoker. I'm impressed by how modern the Evoker feels, and there are similarities in terms of design philosophy to the Demon Hunter in terms of mobility. Uh, are there? I mean, I guess Hover kind of feels like Fell Rush on a much longer cooldown, and it's obviously a caster variant where you can cast while moving, but it kind of moves like Fell Rush, just a little slower. Can you expand on the design principles of mod modernity? Is that how you say that? Uh, especially as WoW has classes developed in an older MMO combat style? That's a great question. I think when you add a new class to a game that has 12 classes and 36 specs, an important question is, what is the thing that will immediately make this feel fresh and different? Uh, I don't know if I actually care. We've played a lot of Evoker, and we played much more Evoker than they probably played before this interview, most likely. So I, I don't, I'm not super interested in it. Is he, is he just like filling time here? He's filling, he's filling, he's filling, he's filling. Yeah, none of that's interesting. Every time you add a class, it's not just the work of creating a class. It's a commitment to a class. Uh, you need to iterate on and balance for the rest of your life of the game. Does that perhaps make the team a little anxious or hesitant to add new classes considering how it's going to add to the permanent workload and delicate balancing of all these different classes and specs you already have? Actually, a good question. I don't think I'm going to read the answer, though, because I... Wait, um... I just don't know what his answer could be. I'm just going to skim it. Uh, more class sets and do more stuff forever. It's also carrying costs and complexity burning. There's also two more specs to learn now. When you're in PvP, you have to understand how they work. Uh, we were coming up with the feature set. Idea of giving players a chance to realize a fantasize or realize the fantasy of being a dragon. Yeah, nothing there. Evokers in draconic form uh don't display all their armor how does an evoker specifically oh wow we don't care about that yeah okay customization options we can probably skip all of this apparently with the drac theory it's actually millions of options like if uh like if you were to actually like make something unique there are over a million different i don't care about that but every time it's brought up people insanely pog like this is like a huge pog thing i'm pretty sure like, people really, 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 really like customiz character customization in games, for sure. Uh, can skip that. Mythic Plus Dungeons. Uh, we've already heard them talk about this a lot. I wonder if the question is any different than what they've answered before. Can you explain your intentions with the new expansion as far as Mythic Plus Pool is concerned? Uh, you guys are obviously experimenting with bringing back keys from previous expansions now. I just wanted to know if you guys plan on continuing that or if this is something you guys are waiting to hear feedback on in this last season. Oh, this is a good question. For sure, that's a path we're going to take for Dragonflight Season 1. Uh, we, we're we already well underway on updating old dungeons. The plan is a pool of eight dungeons for the first Mythic Plus season, four new Dragonflight dungeons, as well as some old fan favorites from across the years. A couple of examples are this and Court of Stars, so everyone can go back and play Guess Who again. Uh, and I think we're really excited to both revisit some old dungeons that have a structure where really a new Mythic Plus season can mean as much variety as a new raid tier. There will be new challenges, new rewards, and a whole new set of problems to solve 
which also frankly serves as a little bit of community knowledge reset and makes for a smoother point of entry for players getting into the scene. 100%. Yes. I think this is a banger idea. We can we can discuss this after this. I know people, Mythic Plusers, there are Mythic Plusers that absolutely don't like this, and there are a couple things to like talk. And it, they'll try, and if it doesn't work, they'll go off of it. But I promise, and I've heard all of your arguments, all the arguments against this, I think if you guys actually do it, the second you log into Season 2 and you are doing eight new dungeons, that is going to be a such a better experience that all that other shit is not going to matter. The only way it's bad is if, like, for example, Season 1 randomly has, like, insanely good dungeons, and then Season 2, even though they're new, they all suck. That would be prob a problem. Max, did you already see the Warcraft Logs poll? No. What was the poll about? Power infusion? <laughs> Dude. Do you guys remember reading the PI article here where he mentioned game one and game two. So you're telling me that the literal website where every single person playing game two uh, spends all of their time on ran a poll about PI in which that is the part of the game where people hate PI. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the results of that poll, but I could almost guarantee I could guess. I, I'm, I'm almost positive. Oh, it's about how to show it. Oh, I'm misunderstanding the poll. Sorry, dude. I was expecting you guys to say, Max, did you see the poll that Warcraft Logs did about PI? And like the poll was just this. PI good? Yes, no. And they would just obviously on Warcraft Logs, the answer would be no. Like, but like 100%. Um, let's see. Uh, while we're, I mean, I guess we can check that out, right? Warcraft Logs. Where's the poll? The poll is about the power infusion ability in Dragonflight and how you would like to see it handled in rankings. There are several possible options. Vote for the option you most prefer below. I don't care. That's definitely me. Uh, ban power infusion from rankings completely. That's kind of scorched earth. Then people are going to get PI'd and that's going to create a problem where people are getting PI'd in raid to kill a boss and they're mad because their parse doesn't count. <laughs> that's kind of funny though. Leave power infusion the way it is now with the uses being shown in an extra column in rankings. Ban power infusion from rankings when the player receives it too often, i.e. gets fed, gets fed it above a reasonable threshold. And have two entirely sets of rankings with PI and without PI. The default would remain as it is now. I feel like... I'm, I, I think if I cared... About PI, it would be five by a mile. Right? I mean, two two is like the, like, you're an agent of chaos. And, like, you just, like... I mean, this literally creates the exact problem, but it's the opposite. Where now no one wants PI and they have to have it. Well, obviously in guilds that care about parsing. Which is almost all guilds, just not mine. It's just, I just, I, like, I have to say that because, like, when I say all guilds, it just feels weird because that's just never something we ever think about. But it's, it is absolutely a real thing. It's five. It's definitely five. Five, I mean, five would be my answer, but I certainly don't fucking care. So I'm just going to say that. Uh, what are the results? Oh, we can't see them. Huh. Either way. Back to this. Uh, okay, so let's read the rest of this and then we'll talk since the ads are over. Even though we have new seasonal affixes, we've observed that over the course of the expansion that is challenging for people when you're 12 to 15 months in to do the same dungeons to reach the same level of sophistication, refinement, and community expectations for what you're supposed to know. It's so stratospherically high that it can be a rough experience for someone trying to get in later. If you don't have a patient group of friends to help you, we're really hopeful and excited about the structure. Obviously, whether we uh, stick with it, whether it becomes the future of Mythic Plus, that's going to depend on how it plays out. What we hear from the community, and as always, we'll be listening and trying. Yeah, what they should, what they should, like, here's good uh, feedback, is, like, in the first season, if, like, one or two dungeons they bring back suck ass, 
identify what about them sucks ass and just try to avoid picking dungeons from the past that have those same elements. And I can tell you right now, one of those things is going to be very out of date bosses. Like bosses have gained in their quality over time. Even bosses from two or three expansions ago could, you could do them and be like, what? Like, what the fuck? You know, like that. And then also hopefully Blizzard understands that long dungeons are just almost objectively not as good as shorter dungeons with less bosses. Uh, and big AOE pulls, random thing. But okay, I have heard, and I, I think it's a bad take, honestly. Like, like people who are just like, no, like, you know, we're only gonna get four new Dragonflight dungeons in the first Mythic Plus season. There's still gonna be eight dungeons in the game. You can do them, you're gonna do them as you level. You can do them at Mythic Zero at max level. You just won't do them in Mythic Plus. You'll only do four of them in Mythic Plus for the first season. But what this allows you to do is like the okay we, we actually did this shitty paint drawing the other day where like this over here is like the i think what i did was like the mastery this is the mastery of the of keys you are doing okay and over here is the expansion right and this is just over the, oh this i mean i guess this is stupid this is just time okay and right now two years is like how long you guys are doing these dungeons right so like right as soon as they come out it's like up to a very high level of mastery and then it just does this and it does keep going up if you were to look at the difference of your mastery of these dungeons because people still innovate right it's just at a much 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 less level than when it first releases right so like if you look at two years it's decently higher than what it was in the middle of season one like you're much better at these dungeons but that is not nearly as good as the scenario where in the exact same thing in this expansion right uh, with uh, Mastery of Keys you are doing down here and you know, time it's going to look like this it's going to be like big learning done big learning and you're done and you're just doing it again and you know what the most fun shit ever in Mythic Plus is is when you log in and it's new and and you're doing this part because everything is new you're constantly innovating everyone gets a chance to do it too you're not just watching someone stream and doing what they're doing like this is like fucking awesome and i promise you all the like issues you guys have with this as soon as you experience this for the first and then the second season you'll be like you will never be able to go back from this ever the fact that you only get four new drugs like Dude, two weeks into doing Mythic Plus, if you're actually someone who spams Mythic Plus, it's not going to feel any different than doing an old thing brought back than a new dungeon. Some are good, some are bad. Hopefully they pick good dungeons. The only issue I have with this, and again, they've said they're going to basically refine and evolve it based on feedback. Also, if you couldn't tell, there's only four Dragonflight, or eight du Dragonflight dungeons right now. There's going to be four in Season 1 and Season 2. There's going to be more than two seasons in this next expansion, we hope, right? So, the the like season three and four, they're gonna have to like choose some to bring back, right? They're gonna like bring back hopefully the best of the bunch, you know, or some more other shit. Like, but pick the four best dungeons and bring them back. Cause like some dungeons are objectively better than other dungeons. That's just a fact, right? So like uh, Blizzard like identifying that and bringing back certain ones would be really good. Uh, and they'll like figure that, over, figure that out over time. Uh, the only thing that is going to suck. And, and another thing I'm no, sorry, another thing that's good before I talk about what's gonna suck. Another thing that's insane, too, is the items you have to farm every patch. The, like, meta of what gear is good is going to be changing and evolving and also innovating over the course of every patch. Instead of you farming the same trinket for two fucking years, in every season you're kind of going for something else. I think that's fucking great, right? So, the only bad part I see of this is, let's say, uh, the first season here, right? So, this is season one of Dragonflight. Okay, you're done, you've done all the innovation, you've done all the innovation, and it's great. Let's just say it's the best dungeon set of all time. The dungeons they bring back are insane. I mean, Court of Stars is one of the best dungeons ever. I, I mean, literally no question it won't be, it's insanely good. Um, but like, let's just say the other ones they bring back, like one is bad, let's say Temple of Jade Serpent sucks, and then the other two are good. And then like the four Dragonflight dungeons are all turbo bangers, like freehold good, right? Now. What happens when you just lose all these good dungeons? And yes, it'll be fun at the beginning of Season 2, because you're going to be learning a bunch of new stuff, but right when it gets to this point right here, where you're refining, 
everyone's going to come potentially could come to a realization where they're like, yo, learning new stuff is cool, but also these dungeons are way worse than the one we were doing last season. I don't think I want to play Mythic Plus anymore, right? That's an, that's something that's possible. I mean, obviously the reverse could happen, right? Season one could be dog shit, and then the season two dungeons are insane, right? I'm just, I'm just saying this is a potential problem where there needs to be a way where if Blizzard encounters a Court of Stars, a Freehold, uh, a Mists, a Halls, a dungeon that just owns people fucking love doing it, that it's like, okay, keeping some of the dungeons is fine as long as you are good at identifying what dungeons people actually like and why. Right? So, uh, yeah. All right. All right, y'all, I, I don't I, I don't want to take any of this Mist hate. Mist is such a good dungeon. Um, yeah. All right, here we go. Let's see. Moving on. So that's my whole Mythic Plus take. Tanks have a lot of responsibility. Okay, it sounds like everyone here... Okay, everyone I talk to that I play Mythic Plus with all likes Mist a lot. But they're all people who, like, I've been doing high keys with. It's possible that I just had a very small sample size and it turns out everyone hates Mist. But I really enjoy it. Uh, the only thing that's weird about the mists is like the whole like game with the second boss, but the rest of it's great. Uh, uh, here we go. Tanks have a lot of responsibility, especially Mythic Plus. The tank pool is sometimes really small. A lot of groups in looking for group looking, uh, looking to wait for a tank. Is there anything you could think could be coming in Dragonflight to encourage tanking, especially when Evoker doesn't have a tank spec? Oh, well, okay, this last part, I don't even know why that's in the question. The first part of this question, that's actually, in an, I would love to ask that question myself. This is an insanely good question. Uh, the Evoker not having a tank spec, I hope he doesn't focus on that, because that is just a totally irrelevant part of this question. Um, this is something we talk about a lot, Evoker not having a tank spec. Oh, no, he's talking about Evoker not having a tank spec. Wait, I think is more of a reflection of the fantasy. No, no, this is the part that doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, oh, I see why they said that. You guys are saying because Evoker having a tank spec would help solve the problem because people would just be playing something new where now the new thing is DPS and healer, so there's going to be relatively less tanks next expansion than there are now. That's, okay. I get why they're saying that. I just think that didn't need to be, yeah. Uh, okay. Even looking back historically, I don't know that we saw a massive increase in the number of tanks due to Demon Hunters existing. That was also because they were horrific for a very long period of time. That has very little to do with new class, very much to do with class bad. Uh, a lot of tanks may have switched specs or classes because they liked the mobility or toolkit compared to other tanks. Uh, but it's more of a mindset. Uh, wanting to be responsible for survival, for positioning, for leading a group through a dungeon, and yeah, that can be a very high barrier. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of cases, tanking... There's, like, two cases in this game where tanking is, like, definitely an extremely, uh, like, involved role, and it's just extremely difficult, and you have way more responsibility than everyone else. Basically, High Mythic Plus, I'm... At, like, the very highest levels, everyone has to play at, like, a super high level, but that, like, mid-level, like, 18 to 25 key, I'm just gonna make up a number, probably also 15s. Like, the tank... The tank skill level has so much more to do with the success of that key than anyone else, and it's not even fucking close. Like, it's... It's like... I mean, it's, it's actually so much more than anyone else. Like, they're deciding where you go. If they die, it's fucking over. Like, everything. Right? Um, and the, the other time... And this is actually another weird thing. You guys remember how we talked the other week about how it's really hard to recruit healers? We were talking about this with Growl. Because, like what you are expected to do in like a world first guild when you're healing is like you know all the utility stuff obviously but also like healing correctly with a group and more importantly fitting in as much damage as you possibly can right but getting and ascending the guild ranks as a healer at any guild rank right now that isn't the very top they don't teach you that at all because in reality most guilds that recruit are going to recruit you based on your HPS number, so you're actually incentivized to not do damage, so you never actually learn that skill set of when to weave and when to not, because you're so focused on doing more healing so you can get into a better guild, right? So it's like really hard to recruit healers, extremely hard, because they're not even doing what you need to do, and they need a lot of time in this setting to actually get good at it. Um, and that it's, it's very similar with tanks as well. The reason why I'm saying this is... Like, another thing with tanks is, like, tanking at a world-first level, like, tanking, like, 
jailer uh, that week. Like on like a less geared character. I mean, you're I, I mean, like there's literally like almost nothing in this game is harder than that. Sire Denathrius, week one mythic. There, like that might be like one of the hardest things to do in the game. Easily harder than every other role on those uh, on those fights, right? Um, uh, to to actually do relevant damage, which really matters, and also never die. It helps with like cheat death trinkets being introduced in the game for something like Jailer. Dude, Jailer, if cheat death trinkets didn't exist, you guys would have a totally different opinion of your tanks on that fight. By the way, uh, yeah, and yeah, and then that's the and but that's the thing is that like when you're over geared, it like kind of is so much easier that it doesn't really prepare you for like what tanking that even is except for mythic plus tanking even though it's a bit different um let's see and so i think by lowering that barrier bit hopefully we can make it well i actually didn't read the end of what he said to some extent i think rotating the dungeon pool may help with that for some reasons i was saying earlier part of the challenge is as the tank you're expected to know the route the poles where to clump mobs etc and if you're learning uh, and if you're learning, unless you have a patient group of friends, you're learning at the expense of the group, while other roles have the ability to hang back and kind of follow along and pick up the knowledge that way. And so I think by lowering that barrier a little bit, hopefully we can make it more accessible. So basically he's saying that less people playing tanks in dungeons, which is due to a barrier of entry, is being lowered by the fact that there's less knowledge base going into season two or three from a tank who's tanked all of season one and two, uh, than a tank who's just starting, so people never get into it. I don't actually know if that's why a lot of people, I'm not in this position, so I'm totally guessing, but I don't know if that's actually why a lot of people don't tank. A lot of people are saying absolutely true. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay, he's spitting. Never mind, chat. You guys know more than me. You guys have a way, way better perspective of this than I do. Okay, so very, very, okay, hell yeah, there we go. Uh, we're also being mindful to tank gameplay itself and what we ask tanks to do in terms of our encounter design, especially in dungeons, with how much you are using active mitigation, how much positioning matters, and how many other things you can do wrong as a tank. We're already expecting a ton of you, while in raid encounters, you might not be moving a lot as a tank, and you're focused on active mitigation and managing your boss and your own health in that regard, we're probably not throwing as much as you at you there. Yeah. The game and community as a whole benefits from more more people there are to tank. The more groups can form. That's something we're definitely trying to increase interest in. Yeah. I mean, naturally, there's just... Because most people who PvE do Mythic Plus and Raid. So there's always naturally going to be less tanks than every other role by default. Because in Raids, you need you know, roughly four healers, 14 DPS, and two tanks. So in Dungeons, you need... Uh, one, one, three, but that ratio is not the same in raids. So dungeons will always be looking for tanks, kind of. Uh, unless there's just randomly a bunch of tanks that only Mythic Plus and not raid. I could definitely see that. I'm pretty sure being a good Mythic Plus tank has to be like some of the most rewarding content you could ever do. Like, I don't think any other game's tanking experience comes anywhere close to the challenge level and gratification you feel of doing really well on that kind of content. Uh... Let's see, the uh, the gaming community as a whole benefits the more people are, yeah, read that. Okay, in Wrath, we had a little looking for group bag. Could that kind of incentive be possible? Oh, that's, so like queuing up in Mythic Plus as a tank for like the first couple months of the expansion, you get a little bag, little bag with the H. Um, I mean, Talk about Wrath Nostalgia. Holy fuck, people would go crazy for the bag. Uh, I'm not... Let's see. He says, yes, that's an interesting question. Uh, so, he wants people to feel rewarded for joining a group. Yeah, because they're not. They don't feel rewarded right now, right? Like, it's actually, like, dude, if you're, like, timing a 15 in most seasons, like, how your tank feels at the end of that dungeon versus your DPS, at least, some dungeons are really hard to heal. Like, it's, in a lot of cases, it's like the Holandris melee versus ranged meme where, like, the dungeon ends and the tank is, like, wiping the sweat off of his forehead and, like, catching his breath and, like, the DPS are, like, listening to that Maroon 5 song and, like, singing and dancing, right? So, like, if the tank has to actually go through that he should feel rewarded for it. So yeah, give him a give him a fucking bag or something. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, a common criticism among some players is having to do content that they don't like in order to do content that they do like. Wowhead kind of asking the good questions, such as Mythic Plus and rating interactions. Is that a problem to solve? And if it is, how are you doing it in Dragonflight? What a f I will never understand why someone in my chat yesterday, someone was like, yo, there's a Wowhead interview. And I was like, oh, cool. And they were like, you don't want to read it, though. It's kind of boring. Huh? Okay. Okay. I think it's certainly... Uh, I think it's certainly a problem to solve as stated by those players. At the end of the day, one of the shifts that we made over the course of the Shadowlands, I think was re-examining some of our philosophies, assumptions, and interconnectedness. Oh, I, I, guys, I owned saying that word. I didn't even like, I like kind of read it. I was like looking over here and then I saw it and I just fucking slammed the whole word. I like barely even looked at it. Um, and how important it was for all players to need to do certain systems or certain pieces of the game uh, versus taking a step back and just letting people focus on what they prefer to focus on while encouraging them and giving them optional rewards for branching out. So I think what we saw in Eternity's End, the final major patch for Shadowlands, was some of those philosophies in action. I mean, this is definitely true. Without going any further, like, you would have to be the most, like, violent Blizzard hater to not realize that they've absolutely changed their tune probably more than they ever have in any amount of time in this game uh, from 9.1 to 9.1.5 and onwards with the changes they made. Complete, and those those were not random changes. Complete and total ph uh, philosophy shift. Um, if you look at the uh, end game of Shadowlands today, there's plenty of content in the outdoor world in Xerath Mortis that there is those who want to engage deeply with it. We have an entire cipher system that you can unlock and improve. Yeah, cipher, 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 love that. Uh, we wanted to get away from the sense of checklist of weekly or daily chores. Uh, of all right, if all right, I have to do this. Or oh, weekly and daily chores of all right, I have to do this thing, or I'm going to fall behind or let my ray group down. We've seen and heard good feedback and seen success, and you know what? There are plenty of people running around Zareth Mortis, and there are enough people who enjoy that content on its own right that it can stand on its own. Uh, not people who play game two don't do a lot of Xerath Mortis now, but I think that's true as game one as far as I've heard, but, uh, they, I think Xerath Mortis was absolutely, it's hard to tell how good Xerath Mortis would have been in like a regular expansion. Like obviously Xerath Mortis definitely hard dunks on Corthia and season one, but I don't know if it's actually good because those were pretty bad. Oh, wait, you guys are saying I preferred Corthia? Fuck Corthia. Dude, the duality of man. Here we go. THD. Corthia was way better. Corthia Biss, bro, right under that. Three lines down. Fuck Corthia. Corthia is the worst thing of all time. <laughs> fuck Corthia. Fuck Corthia. Fuck Corthia. Okay. Okay. Corthia is very controversial. I now, I now know this. I won't bring it up again. I'm sorry. Uh... Okay, one of our pillars is really, as much as possible, let the people play the game they want to play it. Don't require them to do things they don't enjoy in order to compete or have access to the things they do. This remains a guiding principle. Will we have 100% success rate there? Not necessarily, and there are some things like if you don't want to level, sorry, you have to level. We want everyone to have a baseline understanding of the shared world, the story, the stakes, the characters from going through the world. By the way, we're all cool that we have to level but definitely make leveling alts like twice as fast as it is right now after your main is done. Okay, but if you want to hit max level and spend most of your time pushing Mythic Plus keys and not worry about getting your Renown levels up in the different zone factions, okay, you'll miss out on some cool cosmetics and rewards and items, uh, but you'll have better or equal items from Mythic Dungeons, and that's fine. Choose your path. Okay, so he actually gets to answering the question at the end. So he doesn't really answer this question at all. I think what people were, I mean, people were looking at is basically people wanted to hear is Mythic Plus going to get higher level gear in the upcoming expansion? And he basically just didn't answer it. Uh, but I really doubt they will. That's always like a really, uh, really weird topic because like a lot of people Mythic Plus and raid, but a lot of people like Mythic Plus and they raid because they have to. Um, I don't know. 
Like, the last couple of bosses dropping higher eye level gear, I feel like makes sense. Those bosses are really hard, and you have to get all the way through the raid on Mythic to get to them, to get higher eye level gear than you get out of your vault for Mythic Plus. And, like, you have to assemble fucking 20 people and, like, get at that shit for months. Like, the whole, like, MMO philosophy, or just the whole thing with MMOs, is you want to feel properly rewarded for the time and effort you put into something. That is just, that's that's it. That's like what MMOs are. And like, that is absolutely true with an end mythic boss in any season ever, right? Uh, uh, and then, oh dude, this is when people make the hilarious argument. Dude, they don't do it as much anymore, but when Mythic Plus first came out, they're like, oh, you think you think an end mythic boss is hard? Well, well how come it was killed like three months ago and no one's time to 35 <laughs> or 50? <laughs> Oh my god, dude. Okay, but, uh, let's see, uh, people don't do that a lot, but like that, people absolutely used to rip that, and they're, and they, they were completely serious. Um, it's weird though, because like, so two things can't happen, right? So, Mythic Plus drops a little bit lower, or it's like a little bit higher eye level than, uh, Heroic, right? But and it can be upgraded to be a little bit less than Mythic. Dude, getting doing Mythic Plus and getting gear that's the eye level of Mythic when you can just spam those dungeons over and over again does not make sense for WoW's reward system at all. Not even kind of. However, at 15, your gear level is capped. Even though, like, the skill isn't capped and the difficulty isn't capped. You get the same gear for timing a 28 than you do timing a 15. Uh, which, I mean, that, like, kind of doesn't make sense. Like, it's just way fucking harder. And you could use the exact same argument for raids as to why you should get better gear for that. It is a it is much harder, and it requires much more time commitment to, like, make it up to that level with a group of people. It's the exact same argument as raid. However, it would just be super weird with the gearing in this game, if like top raiders, for example, with their gear from raid after we finish Jailer, just run into Mythic Plus and just do 25s and farm full 278 gear because we have that much gear to do those keys and like other people don't because they haven't raided and then like, and then you can just like actually infinitely farm 278 gear. Then like, what's the point of raiding, right? So like, like there's a reason that things are like that. I think maybe if anything, allowing Valor, if you've like cleared 20s or something, to like actually upgrade to 278 from Mythic Plus gear, but it just requires much more Valor than it does to get to 272, for example. Cause then eventually you get there and you don't really have to raid. And then obviously the like Scorched Earth total redesign is Mythic Plus gear works like PVP, uh, where you just, the gear you get in Mythic Plus has higher eye level and it's just better for Mythic Plus than raid gear is. Um, I don't know what it is about that for me, but that just sounds like shit. And I think maybe it's because like, people look at it like PVP, Raid, and Mythic Plus. But like really what it is, is like PVP and PVE. Those are the things that are just totally fucking different worlds, like nothing in common at all. Right? Uh, but I, I don't, I don't, like, I don't know. Uh. I, I don't know exactly how they should do it, but it's definitely, I mean, well, this is not a good sign because they didn't answer it at all. I just tried to like kind of throw out the different talking points for it. I understand all the all the points people make, but I also understand how Blizzard is kind of in a bind for sure. Because like currently to raid, like here's how the game is right now. To raid, you need to farm Mythic Plus gear. There's multiple Mythic Plus items that are bis every patch. And the next expansion in Dragonflight, there's going to be different trinkets and different items that are bis every patch for raid in dungeons. Just like there are in raid, right? With different stuff. Uh, and you and to do high mythic plus, you need to raid. Not like 15s. You can do 15s without raiding easily. But like to do high mythic plus, you need to raid. To do high level raiding, you need to mythic plus. So when you put it like that, it sounds like it kind of works just fine. Right? Uh, so who knows? Yeah, but not everybody likes to do both. Yeah, and that's the, and that's the, and that's the critical issue is there are people who just like to raid and not Mythic Plus, and there are, are a lot of people who just like to Mythic Plus and not raid. 
That is, that is absolutely a problem they need to solve. And then THD comes in with the well you plan MMO. Go play COD if you want to do one thing, Lamau. Uh, I don't think quite that. But yeah, I mean, because like if you were to say that for me, like imagine, okay, dude. Okay, he's going to have some stupid answer to this. But if you were to ask most people, you're going to actually frame exactly what he just said. Uh, but for PvP instead. Okay, let's say that to raid at all, you have to do a pretty moderate amount of PvP every week. Everyone. To raid. Like, you have to. I don't think people would feel the same way. Right? They, If you were to do the whole, like, oh, it's an MMO. If you want to do one thing, just play another game. You have to do everything, dude. If if you had to PvP as a... You had to PvP as a pve -er, so many people would fucking quit. Like, actually, so many people would have to quit. They Like, I would fucking quit. Like, <laughs> like get me the fuck out of there. I have that, no fun at all. Yeah, dude, let me just go in and I just... Dude, I want to, like, fuck up this guy. I have, like, all my cooldowns up. Oh, that's weird. I can't play my character. Necrotic affix simulation where you just have to kite and do nothing. Except that's just what you do all the time in PvP. Get me out, man. But you had to for essences? Yeah, I think a lot of people would say that that sucked. Wait, are you guys trying to make a good argument? When I just said it would suck if PvEers had to do PvP for content and you referenced farming blood of the enemy as to support your point? That was awful. That was terrible. <laughs> but, but yeah, the uh But yeah, I mean but let's put it the other way around. If PvEers had to do PvE to compete in PvP, they would hate it. And they have, because that was how the game was for a long time until they added the PvP eye levels back, right? They they did. They had to, like, farm trinkets, and they fucking complained about it all the time. So, like, clearly there's an issue right now where people, a large, I don't know, actually, don't, I'm not even going to guess how many people it is, but, like, some people definitely don't like doing multiple things, and they just want to do their own thing. And who knows? They need to look at it. That was a long thing, but, you know. And this is the thing I didn't get. Similarities to Mists. When you were designing Dragonflight, what do you think the biggest inspirations were? And what do you think are the biggest things you learned from some places in WoW's history that got criticism in the past? Oh, thanks for the sub, Sneaks. Yo, I don't have my Tier 1 notifications on. If you guys are all subbing, I appreciate the fuck out of that. Big time. Uh, what the fuck is this answer in question? Um, but... For something that's different, I think a direct inspiration for this expansion is actually probably Mists. If I had to pick an expansion in the past that's closest in feel and overall vibes, it's this massive verdant land with ancient secrets and mysteries, and we're arriving on its shores as explorers. There's a lot to discuss, a lot to learn. This isn't an expansion where the kickoff is like, there's an existential threat that's going to destroy Azeroth, we need to stop it and drop everything. There's trouble brewing, there's mysteries, there's secrets, there's concerning things, let's explore an adventure, and I think that's Warcraft at its best. Yep. I mean, so this isn't true with, like, casual players usually, which is, like, most of people who play WoW, especially if you talk about historically. Uh, but, like, pretty much anyone that did play the game for the end game reasons they play now, any Mythic Pluser or Raider that plays now that did play in Mist, which actually probably is not a huge part of the player base, they would all tell you that Mist is probably their favorite expansion, if not top three, right? Uh, so that, it seems fan y but, like, the majority of WoW players actually don't think that. Majority of WoW players, Mist is probably not even a top three expansion. Or if it is, it's like top, th probably third. Like I like it's probably Wrath is like most people's first. If you were to talk about casuals, uh, yeah, Mist Mist is definitely my favorite expansion of all time. But that's well documented. Speaking frankly about the community feedback we've received, I think Mist failed to connect with some people who just passed on it. On the outset, looking at the theme, Aw Pandas, that doesn't seem Warcraft. That is, dude, that's very real. A lot of people did not play that, that expansion for that exact reason. But the people who engage with that expansion cite it fondly as one of their favorites. Facts. And that's why, and, 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 and this reason right here is why a lot of, like, WoW Classic Boomers rate this expansion lowly. Uh, and some of that is just the universal joy in the journey and exploration on the human cycle. Uh, with new cultures, allies, making the enemies as you go. And so that's the type of story where they set out to tell the building in Dragon Isles, and hopefully Dragon are a slightly more universally resonant theme. Yo, let's go. 
Dude, shout out to randomly THD last week releasing a WoW expansion tier list. And a year ago, he linked a tier list with Mist of Pandaria in, in A tier. And then when he released it this year, he had Mist of Pandaria in S tier. So in one year's time, he changed his opinion on an expansion that came out seven years ago, which very importantly, he didn't even play. He wasn't even there. He has no opinion on it whatsoever. So, oh, 10 years ago, not seven. Yep. Uh, so, so yeah. Uh, here's, here's the thing. If you guys are rating expansions, it's okay to omit things you weren't a part of and just make shit up. That's fine. There's no way. Every time I rate expansions ever, I only rate the expansions I ever played. I always just put like classic and TBC somewhere and I'm like, I have no opinion. So I guess the, the moral of the story is if you don't know something about a topic, it's 100% okay to not have an opinion on it. All good. All right. Uh, in Group Loot, in a previous interview, you mentioned that Master Loot was something you wanted to do, but were looking for the right implementation. Which kind of a change from no previously? Any update to that? Uh... Yeah, I think we describe it more as group loot rather than master loot. That's the specific process of a single loot master allocating the drops. That's actually in some ways some of the stuff we were looking to move away from back in the day. But moving away from the personal to a shared pool of loot where when you kill a raid boss, you work together with 15 or 20 or 30 people to do it. There's five items on the corpse and you can roll for those items. You can pass on them. You can trade them to your friends. That's a world we think we want to be in again. We're still hammering out the details, but our current plan is to have raid bosses and dragonflight work that way. This is a raid boss specific system. Dungeon loot is fine. We haven't really heard people clamoring for the return of group, group loot in dungeons and getting a bow from a chest at the end of a dungeon when a group has no hunter. I think raids are a unique cooperative experience that lend themselves to a co cooperative loot allocation mechanism, and that's the current plan. So, wait, so Mythic Plusers are mad they don't get this? Uh, no, I think... I think, uh... I think Mythic Plusers would, that's definitely, if Mythic Plusers are mad that they don't get group loot, for sure, that's a you think you do, but you don't think. Current Mythic Plus loot is totally fine. Uh, and again, imagine, imagine, dude. Imagine you're on group loot and you get to the end of a dungeon and a fucking bow drops and there's just not a hunter in sight. That'd be a terrible thing. Oh, am I doing the thing where I'm making a shitty straw man argument against one singular viewer in a sea of seven and a half thousand people, and then all of you had to sit here and listen to this? Yeah, I do that sometimes. Dude, dude, I don't know why I do that, but like, I'm just, I mean, it's, it's hard, because like, okay, it's because I can't read every message. So sometimes I read, I pan over, I read exactly one message, and it happens to be bad. It just, that's why it happens, like, usually like once a stream. Uh... Yeah, the way I try to imagine it when I realize that those things are bad, bad, including interacting with people who are hating on you, uh, is I think of it like this. Imagine you're in a stadium, right? Imagine you're in like a giant, like there's seven and a half thousand people. Imagine seven and a half thousand people sitting in an auditorium and you're just on stage with a microphone talking to them. And like, that's the kind of the equivalent of this, but not really, right? Or whatever's on my computer screen is on a Jumbotron or something. Okay, and then like, you're like just doing your content and then you notice someone in the second row of uh of of just any part of the stadium one guy and he just just holding up a sign and it's just like mythic plus should get group loot and then i ignore all of the thousands of people in there and i focus in on this one idiot that decided to hold up a sign and he's the only person in here who thinks this shit and then i'm like derailing the whole you know, stream to like talk to that person, similar to how I'm derailing the stream right now by doing this entire analogy. But uh, and it's the same thing with haters. Dude, like early in my stream thing, like anytime someone in my chat would come in and say some hateful ass shit, like way back in the day, especially like before we uh, started winning, uh, I would just like, I would talk to them and I felt like I would uh, like have to like change their mind and like some, but like dude, targeted hate is just like, it has nothing to do with any of that. It's mostly to do with stuff that's going on in their life than anything to do with you. But like, that's the same analogy I think of. It's like why I stopped referring to those people or derailing my stream to talk to them at all was because I just pictured them as that guy in the sign that's just holding up a sign, just like, oh, fuck you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then it's just like, imagine just like derailing everything you're talking about on stage in this auditorium 
and then you just look at this person and talk to him alone and everyone else is like dude what <laughs> that's that was basically how i uh yeah anyways we just did exactly what i'm talking about right now for five minutes but i think it was probably interesting to someone uh so this is interesting though i don't know is he is he uh is he uh, saying that raid bosses will only have group loot? Like personal loot is no longer an option? Because that's that's definitely if that's what it sounds like. So that's that's interesting. Because like the last time that any version of like group loot or master loot was in the game, uh, personal loot also existed and it was a choice. And exactly how it worked in Legion, the end of Legion, was if you had Guild Master Loot, I think, I'm just going to make up a number, you got like five items off of a Mythic Raid boss. And then if you were personal looting, you got six items. But they, obviously, it was personal loot, it was random. So, like, you didn't really want to personal loot, even though you did get 20% uh, more items off of every boss, it was random, so it was worse, right? Um... Oh, what is it? Someone added me. It's raid leader discretion on loot. Personal loot is still available. That's good. I actually think that this is better than them bringing back master loot. And I think it's all about community perception. Something about master loot and the whole like raid leader ninjaing items and stuff is is like even though I think it's very rare that that actually happens, like it does happen, but it's like way more rare than people ever like talk about it. It, it like it happens one percent of the time for every time someone is complaining about ninjing items right it's just uh and also guild master loot made it almost impossible to do that because you couldn't pug into a master loot ever like if you like it's impossible to join a pug in a master loot it doesn't work uh so this uh this does create some interesting situations i think i think group loot is much easier to stomach for most guilds than personal loot uh even though group loot alone is exactly master loot. You can fully master loot just like you used to group loot. It's very easy. Use the same loot add-ons you do right now or not. You just hit need if you need it and greed if it's an off if it's off spec or like a minor upgrade and then you pass if you don't need it, right? Uh like that comes back to the game. Uh but that's like easier to stomach, I think, than the other thing. Cause like if people are really scared of ninja looting, what happens is you're basically putting all of your trust in one person, the loot master with master loot, that he's not gonna ninja your items. Or your uh your husband and wife officer and guild master aren't gonna just loot each other every item and then you never see any, right? With with like group loot, you can still master loot, but it puts the uh responsibility on everyone. It would be almost impossible for someone to, like, ninja loot an item uh, because everyone would be involved in looting, and it's much less likely uh, to, to be the case uh, because everyone has to vote. And if you see someone starting to do that, everyone would just need to help the person who's just doing that, right? And more importantly, and this was even true when Master Loot is coming back, that a lot of people who do not like Master Loot are people who like being in guilds right now who personal loot. And they don't want that to change. They like personal loot. They fuck with it. They don't want anything to do with any kind of loot council or master looter or anything. And they're afraid that even given an option, not a mandatory, but an option, uh, that their guild master would choose to go back to master loot. And that would make them not want to raid where they raid anymore. But my only thing against that is I am, I am positive that every guild right now, there are master loot guilds right now. And what that means is every item that drops is tradable they just master loot those items and if it doesn't matter who loots it you you have no more right to that item than anyone else it goes to the best upgrade that's basically master loot and there are guilds who do that and some of you are in guilds that do that but the vast majority of guilds if you personal loot it even if it's tradable it's yours you can trade it if you want to end of story right i mean 80 percent, 90 percent of guilds probably do this okay uh I would bet that 90 to 95 percent of those guilds that currently do not master loot tradable personal loot items and like give them out to whoever or loot cancel it I bet all of them would remain on personal loot and not change anything about their guild at all because probably the majority of the people in there would want it to remain personal loot and yes would it would it would 
like I said, 5%, a very small amount of guilds with like some tyrannical guild master be like, no, we're not doing it. Maybe. But then if the majority of the people in the guild say like, we don't want that, like a smart leader is going to do what the majority of his group wants to do. So it was never something to like be afraid of in the first place. But I understand that it's like a buzzword kind of thing. Okay. Uh, Back to this. Hunter feedback blue post is up. Excellent. Uh, we will look at that after we're done with this. I'm not going to respond to anyone who posts about them. I am just going to uh, continue on with this and then look at it when it's over. That being said, there is not a lot more because there's a ton of dragon riding questions and we're going to skip every single one of them. Um, uh, profession bag. When I saw an alpha, there was... Oh, don't care about that either. And don't care about dragon riding. Oh, wait. Did we end our, our thing on this? Oh, yeah. Uh, group loot, good. It allows us to do... It makes our lives way better. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of guilds that will use group loot instead of personal. And that's good that they have that choice. Adding choice is good. There's no way that giving someone choice to have something that's potentially better for them is bad for the game. It's just not. So, amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, read dragon writing? No. So dragon writing owns. I don't need to hear anything they say about it. Uh, I imagine it's great right now. Uh, and it'll keep getting better because your dragon like learns and like levels up and like learns new shit. It'll probably like do flips and stuff. Cool. Uh, and I'll just find that out when it happens. I don't really care. So the only thing I want to know is if they're going to allow dragon writing in the open world because absolutely it is so good that, uh, it makes regular flying feel really bad and TLDR it's account wide. Amen. Sounds good to me. There's no reason for me to read all of this. Uh, proletariat. That is a, uh, a game dev company that made Spellbreak and like 100 employees or something, all devs and mostly devs, and they uh, joined Blizzard. They are not currently incorporated with Dragonflight because they just joined uh, a few months ago. Uh, they are being like kind of incorporated throughout Dragonflight, probably near middle to end, and they're primarily working on the next expansion as far as I know. Uh, don't need to read that. Dragonflight General, this talks about lore, we don't care. Uh, implementing new things. This is actually somewhat interesting. The biggest challenge in a lot of ways for retaining players is just content. It's stuff to do. It's goals to pursue, to reward. It's part of why we continue to grow World of Warcraft. Uh, team and invest in our potential to do that. Because at the end of the day, even if you have fun, when you run out of stuff to do, you're going to find something else to do. In a social game like World of Warcraft, that can be rough. If you're still having fun, but all your guildmates or people you used to run dungeons with decide to move on to something else, now you don't have a dungeon group anymore. We always want to make sure there's something around the corner to look forward to in WoW. Uh, at the same time, we want to keep welcoming new players. This isn't going to... I'm not going to learn anything into this. Uh, the antagonist in the Azure span just characterizes mindless villains, don't care. Final thoughts on Dragonflight, the Alpha, the Beta. It's an exciting summer. Yeah, this is nothing. Okay, cool. We're done. That was nice.